Light and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Charles Boyer in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents the true story of a man who alone was responsible for most of the methods of police detection in use today. It's called the Bertillon Method. Our star, Mr. Charles Boyer. Only a few days left to sign up for the Autolite Family Charity Drawing. This is Harlow Wilcox reminding you that unless you register by this Monday, May 3rd, you'll miss out on the greatest opportunity ever offered for your church, hospital, school, or other favorite charity to share in $100,000. Listen to what this Connecticut woman recently said. Uh, my name is Mrs. Leon Barr. I have just signed up for this drawing. I think it a wonderful opportunity for people to help their pet charities. And if my name is selected... I shall designate our Greenwich Hospital. So act fast. Sign up tomorrow at any or all of these Autolite family car dealer showrooms. DeSoto, Hudson, Plymouth, Studebaker, Dodge, Willis, Nash, Packard, Kaiser, or Chrysler. Remember, there's nothing to try or buy, no obligation, except printing your name and address. But if you're one of the 25 selected, you will designate your favorite recognized charity to share in $100,000. But remember, there are only a few days left to register, so make sure you sign up tomorrow. And now, Autolite presents transcribed Mr. Charles Boyer in the Bertillon Method, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. century and the fall of spring rain. And a place of Paris, the Bois, a place of fountains and winding promenades. Now of this, drip of rain on leafless trees and the body of a man lying on the thawing earth. A man doubled over, wrapped in tar paper, bound tightly with rope. Murdered man. And kneeling over him, Gira, help me here. Help me untie these robes. Alphonse Bertillon, detective of the French Sûreté. He spent his life putting science to work for the law. He studied and classified human skulls. He measured every bone in the human body and discovered that the measurements of no two human beings were exactly alike. He called his system anthropometry and applied it to apprehension of criminals. And something more to know about him. That now, whenever violence and murder is done, every time Scotland Yard catches a crippen, or the Sûreté, a Landry, or the FBI, a Dillinger, silent tribute is paid to this man, to Alphonse Bertillon, for reasons such as this. Anything in his pockets, Chira? Only these coins. Nothing else. Ah, an event of spring, eh, Monsieur Bertillon? And no identity, and no identity. Now, the tar paper, the rope, were removed from him. I'll want them in my laboratory, Girard. Oh, oh, of course, of course, Monsieur Bertillon. I amuse you, Girard. The tar paper and the rope in the laboratory, as you wish it, sir. I will gather them up. Wait, sir. Hold your lantern closed. Here. These wounds about his head. He was struck from behind. Perhaps as he walked the path there. No. No? Now the lantern. Here, Gerard. Over his hands. The hands of a man who has done no manual labor. And here, Gerard, you see this? His sleeve, sir. His sleeve. His right shirt sleeve. I would be cleaner, newer than the left. Perhaps as he fell, his left arm. Not as he fell. There are men of whom uh, this thing of the shirt sleeves is characteristic, you know. Oh? Yes. Men who deal with uh, writing, with pens, with ink. Who 
wear on their right sleeve a special cuff to protect it from stains, from smudges. Yes, I've seen such cuffs. An office clerk, maybe? Or an accountant? Such a man whose hands are soft and marked with toil as this one's are. And you are? Yes, sir. Where murder is, where death is, there is also something else. Always something else. Identity of the victim of his murderer. Cover him, you are. Cover him from the rain. Inspector Kameskas? Yes, Petty, on what do you wish? To give you the report, sir, of the tests I have made in the laboratory. <laughs> the men of science. Hey, Bertillon, the student, the searcher, the player with test tubes and microscopes. That is the man you are, eh, Bertillon? You wish to hear the report, sir? And the working detective, whose only materials are of informers and drunkards and whisperings and small vengeances. You still sniff at these men, Bertillon? At that method? No, no, sir. Respect them very highly. <laughs> Therefore, you must respect me, your chief, very highly. What are the report, Bertillon? Uh, the results of the test tube in the microscope, sir, and the pattern of the murder of the man we found in the bois. Excellent, excellent. And eloquently spoken. Well, go on, go on. Uh, that he was struck and murdered in a wine cellar. That he was then dragged into a second room, filled with sawdust, sand, and coal. And then into a third room. The room always in blackness, without windows. I marvel, Bertio, and I bow. And it is needless for me to ask if you know where all this took place. The address, perhaps? I believe it was in a house somewhere along the Seine, which would explain the presence of sand uh, stuck to the tar paper. And the room always in blackness and without windows. Surely clairvoyance, Bertio. Only a shirt collar under the microscope. And two colorless blind parasites. A species of blind beetle that can live only in a pitch black room. And on the coat and vest, bacilli of alcoholic fermentation. Which? Which prove the wine cellar. Exactly, sir. Which prove a wine cellar. I marvel. Indeed, I marvel at you, Bertio. And at another thing also. What thing? How rich we are in knowledge and information and deduction. And how ignorant we are of a simple thing, the victim's identity. Not ignorant at all, for his identity is known. Ah. Yes, sir. By the alchemy of this system of yours of weights and measures and contours and proportions. No, sir. Not this system, then. Another system. <laughs> well, we found a wallet. In it, his name, his address. A boy this morning, passing at some distance from the scene, stumbled across it and brought it to his father, who brought it to us. Excellent system. The deceased is Charles Tellier, 33 Rue Saint-Michel. And we know it is he, since the photograph, which was in the wallet, is a likeness of the victim. Also, yes, he was an accountant and uh, matched against our records a thief who left our prisons two years ago. Also, exquisite this finding of wallets with a wife named Lucille. But the name of the murderer, Bertillon. Nowhere? Find him. Alphonse Bertillon, Sûreté. Of Charles? I'm sorry. Do not be. My husband is an unlucky man. Whatever he chooses to do inevitably turns out badly. But when he chooses to break the law he is caught, follows. He is dead. Very well. Thank you. Uh, wait. Yes? He was murdered. He is dead, he was murdered. And it will be his bad luck to lie in a potter's field. 
There is a necessity to find his murderer, Mrs. Tellier. Yes. Who murdered him, then? And why? I don't know. And this. What? There is not very much I do know about him. Only that he worked. Appeared at a certain hour in the evening, not promptly. Was fed. Disappeared or stayed, according to what mysterious thing moved him. Now dead. Now dead, sir. And it would please me if you left now. Did he still work at bookkeeping? At Dumier and Company. The actuary is under Gilbert Street. As I said, Mrs. Tellier, I'm... I am sorry. Be sorry, then. And as I said, it would please me if you yes, left. Yes, yes, of course. In part... Pen. Pad of scratch paper. Which are the three things I allow each of my employees to hold in his desk? So with Monsieur Tellier's desk. Feel. Go ahead and feel. Nothing else in the desk drawer, is there? Inflexible rule. No small objects to hint of motive for murder. No packets of potions or letters of love. Yet I must tell you this. Down the street now, there is a shop. And in this shop of Mr. Cabassou, there are fabulous dresses which must cost each three times the salary of Charles. <laughs> Three times his salary, Mr. Cabassou. Then this Charles Tellier must be a rather poor man, Monsieur Bertillon. Then why should he appear frequently in front of your dress shop? And this he did. So his employer told me. And why should he do a thing like this? It's to think about, isn't it? It is really to think about, really. Married? What? I say, are you married? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Is this uh, your wife? What? I say, is this your... Oh, oh, my wife. But certainly, who else would write such an inscription upon a picture because you are you and I am me, my love, Marcel? Well, <laughs> sister? Uh, true, true indeed. However, this is my wife. I compliment you. I often do, too. Uh, this dress business you have here, very successful, isn't it? I am fortunate. And your home in the back must be luxurious. May I... Compliment you again? Of course. Your clothes. Exquisite. Thank you. Great taste. Less than elegant, I am afraid, for I travel in them to Brussels this evening. Else I would be wearing a touch of brocade and a velvet collar. Nice. Oh, yes. My wife should be here soon. It's a scent she prefers. Yes? Uh, now, another thing. Of course. Is there a cellar here? A cellar? Cellar. Oh, no. Wine cellar. No. Monsieur Cabassou? Yes. I don't have a warrant. But therefore, you cannot search. I wouldn't think of it. Of course. Now, yes? Why should you want a warrant for these particular premises? For... Come in, my dear. Monsieur Bertillon was just on his way out. Hurriedly. So there is not time for an introduction. talking about. Cabassou. Certainly he. Possibly his wife. The murderer? Oh, murderers. Because? Because he's an older man married to a younger woman. But without a fellow, dear Betty. Older man, yes. And married to a younger woman, yes. But without a fellow. You said it yourself. There is a cellar. What? I'm going back there, sir. I'm going to break into the shop. And there will be a cellar. The very one in which was murdered, Tilly. Unless you will issue a warrant, so I may search. Impossible. There are no grounds on which to issue a warrant. Merely that he is married to a younger woman. And the murder victim loitered about. At your own risk, then. No warrant. Yes, sir. And if you are shot for breaking into a shop and a home, we will disavow any knowledge of it. Yes, sir. 
Men have been shot and killed, you know, for exactly that. Seven last year. I looked it up. Uh, good luck, Betty. Yes, sir. <laughs> Autolite is bringing you Mr. Charles Boyer in The Bertillon Method. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Listen to this on-the-spot interview recorded in Bronxville, New York. And what is your name, officer? Patrolman James Morris at the Bronxville Police Department. I understand that you signed up for the Autolite family charity drawing. Is That's that right. Uh huh. And uh, should your name be selected, how would you care to designate the money? I would split it three ways: cancer fund, heart fund, and Bronxville PBA. Very fine. And may I wish you good luck? Thank you very much. Have you signed up yet? Are you giving your favorite recognized charity, either local or national, the unique opportunity to share in one hundred thousand dollars in cash? There's absolutely no cost to you, no obligation at all. All you do is sign your name and address on a registration form at any Autolite Family car dealer showroom. And you may be one of the 25 persons selected. Just think of the thrill you would get when you named your favorite charity to share in $100,000. Registration closes this Monday, so get down to any or all of these car dealer showrooms. DeSoto, Hudson, Plymouth, Studebaker, Dodge, Willis, Nash, Packard, Kaiser, or Chrysler. Remember, only a few days left. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Charles Boyer in Elliot Lewis's presentation of The Bertillon Method, a true story well calculated to keep you in suspense. Bertillon's methods were not only of weights and dimensions by tape and scales, but depended to on measures of the mind. He would say, ask yourself two questions about every premeditated murder. Who profits from this crime? Where is the woman? And prove that 90% of all major crimes have a woman next to them. And said, I distrust a man who always smiles and would, if the occasion demanded it, disguise himself in the rough clothes of the French workman in order to break into a suspect's home. To break into a suspect's home and get caught. You there, put up your hands. I, uh... I have a pistol here, and I shall not hesitate to use it, so put up your hands. Yes, ma'am. Come closer. Yes, ma'am. Gently, for I'm skilled with this weapon. Yes, ma'am. What vileness did you come here to commit? Theft. I am a thief. Yet? Ma'am? Have I not seen you before? <laughs> I doubt it. Sincerely, having spent so much time in prison. How did you get in here? The cellar. The cellar? Yes, the wine cellar. Precisely here the comedy ends, my colleagues, for I am 
Alphonse Bertillon of the French Surety. Call my chief, Monsieur Camascas. Which, after an hour of discussion and compassion for the fantasies of thieves, to prove a point, they did. And Monsieur Camascas, chief of the Surete, came to the precinct station. Release him. It is he, Alphonse Bertillon. Two days later, Bertillon received word that Monsieur Cabassou had returned from Brussels and was now once again in the bosom of his elegant shop and home. Bertillon went there and Monsieur Cabassou. Since you have chosen to interrupt my wife and myself at dinner, Monsieur Bertillon, I am but pleased to offer you a place at our table. Will you? Oh, I'm honored, Monsieur. Thank you. But, Jean, this the criminal of whom I've told you, the thief. <laughs> Was it not an adventure we had, madam? I, in the role of a thief, and you, how well you played your part. Exquisitely. But, Jean, I will not sup with the criminal. I assure you, my dear, he is no criminal, and this matter of his illegal entry into my home while I was in Brussels, we shall discuss properly over sherry and partridge, Marcel. Yes, dear. Set a place for Monsieur Bertillon, the Sèvres Porte. Oh, please. Sit down, sit down, monsieur. Oh, thank you. Uh, may I? May you what? Uh, make an observation upon the elegance of your dinner table, the crystal, the porcelain, the silver shaving dishes. Make it, then, stunning. It is how we conduct ourselves at all times. The precise accessories for the precise occasions. When one must eat, one must eat with elegance. Monsieur. Yes? What are you doing? Your plate, monsieur. And your silver. He's sketching, Jean. Sketching? Yes. Sketching what? You. Why? You have an interesting face. Oh? Exceptionally. I'm not opposed, monsieur. First a thief, now an artist. Oh, not really an artist. I have an exceptional eye for proportion, that's all. Come look at it, Jean. Not very flattering. Well, it's not my intention to flatter. But your intention is to prove you are a criminal. Oh, Jean? Delier was a young man, as you are young, madam. And you, Monsieur Cabassou... Of me, what? You are a possessor of a cellar. Why are you ashamed of your cellar, monsieur? What did you lie about it? What did you say you did not have... Yes, out. Of course. Good night. At first, no cellar. And all at once, Inspector, a cellar. True. Now, why should a man lie about a cellar? Well... Give me one reason why a man, any man, should lie about a cellar. Would you lie about your cellar if someone should say to you, Inspector Kamaskas, is there a cellar in your home? Would you say no? Uh, not unless... Ah, not unless you had committed a murder in your cellar. Uh, true, true. Therefore... I ask that you issue a writ of arrest. Listen to me. I am sure he's a murderer. Listen to me. Very well. Mr. Cabassou is an important man. And why not? Since he has committed an important murder. And if I issue a writ of arrest and he is taken into custody and you cannot prove your accusations, do you realize? I what? can prove them. Oh. In this envelope here, a sketch of Monsieur Cabassou, and the proportions I have indicated here in centimeters, length of jaw to full length of face, eye socket to side of forehead, etc., etc. Yes, yes. Now, I present you with this other data. Please, compare them. Yeah. You should have read, Inspector. Yes. <laughs>
you are under arrest. Here is the writ. Murder. Here. Put on your trousers. This is an outrage. You will see. Murder is always an outrage. This is infamous. I will make you pay. Because you are a man of importance. A man of influence. Yes. Because you are Jean Cabassou. Yes. Purveyor of elegance to the wealthy. Yes. And no longer Jean Planier. I said, and no longer Jean Planier, monsieur. What? Apache. Thief. Cutthroat. How did you know? Friend to a murdered man. It's impossible that you should know. Not impossible. You must have a memory for the time some years ago when you were measured at a small police station for the proportion of the length of jaw to the length of face, of eye socket to the side of forehead. Etc., etc. That you have changed the color of your hair, that you have nine mustache, that you have gained weight, nothing, no disguise. For to disguise the length of an ear or bone structure, impossible. Listen very well. I am Jean Planier, but now I am respectable and honorable man. Exactly why you had to commit murder, to maintain this attitude. Then you know about Charles Tellier. Of course. He was arrested with you, also a thief. Now come back to haunt you with your old sins. Blackmail, monsieur. Yes. An apology. First, I thought this a crime of passion, jealousy, that your wife, lovely woman... She had nothing to do with it. Lovely woman. Monsieur Cabassou, I arrest you in the name of the Republic of France for the murder of Charles Tillier. Alphonse Bertillon, a man who said, One who tries to hide his past is a liar and a fool, for somehow it races to catch up with him and in devious ways overtakes him destroys him, always. Who set a path for modern-day science of criminology. Who left behind countless weapons of detection. Who was one of the greatest forces for law the world has ever known.